Good evening and welcome to the shop here in beautiful Canterbury. I am uh, exploring the world of exotic veneers and or highly figured veneers. Uh, they basically fall into a couple categories. You have crotch veneer, which occurs at the crotch of a tree, like where a branch goes off, you cut across that grain and it produces something like that. So you usually get like a feathery grain that's kind of like, let's say that tree went out like that, it would be formed down there. You would slice those little wafers just below where the Y meets. You find that really heavy figure. And that's a beautiful material. It's quite often used in sunbursts, multi-patch multi pieces. You know, usually it's, of course, it's an even number typically, 8, 10, 12, uh, 16, whatever. This was an extra of an eight-piece match, so that's why you see the number nine on there. But then there's another kind of veneer that is really exciting to discover in the woods, and it's, you'll see this like bulbous growth on a tree sometimes. It's just like this big ball. It looks like a exterior brain on the tree or a tumor of some sort, but it's actually a burl and it is like an area where the tree is reacting to a type of fungus and it just grows around it and you get this wild, swirly, crazy kind of green in there. And they're some, with some trees, they're quite large and they take, it, take these big cuttings of them. But, you know, lots of times they're smaller and like so many things when it comes to trees, you don't know what you're going to get until you cut into it and start slicing away and see what, what you really have in there. So some of the that fall into the burl, burlish category are this one. This is a madrone burl. And I got these from Certainly Wood, these samples you can see down there. This is one of my favorites to use, this Amboynia burl. It was um, popularized in the Art Deco period of the early 20th century, and it's, it's got really classic look to it. And this one, what is this one? Camphor burl. I've not, I, I haven't used that. I, this is just a sample that they sent. And this one's crazy too, isn't it? Like, it's got a pretty predictable pattern, but they're calling this barley burl. I, I'm not sure what kind of wood that is. He's just got barley in quotes, but you could check that out more. On, on Certainly Wood site, they have a section for exotics and burls and crotches, and you can go in that section and read about or see the actual stock they have on hand, and that's how I decided to do some projects based on searching that stock and thinking, oh my God. They, were, they had this red Amboynia burl at one time that I got and I made numerous projects with it because it was so extraordinary and lively. Uh, it's not cheap, but it's pretty amazing the effects you can create with highly figured wood like this. Now check out this one. This is a Carpathian elm burl. This is some pretty wild burl and one of the issues you have as you might have detected with burls and crotches is that when they dry they're only a 42nd of an inch thick most of them they don't stay super flat. I mean this is like a gigantic potato chip and you have to deal with that you know like if I just tried to press this down it would crack all over the place and so we do like a pre-treatment on that. Now I'm not going to use for the purpose of demonstrations this Carpathian Elm. If you want to see that, check out playlist number two. Um, but we're going to be working tonight with this veneer that I'm pretty excited about. It's Mappa Burl. Mappa Burl. It's really a European poplar tree. It comes from a European poplar. I guess they must have a lot of burls on those trees because it's pretty it's pretty available, but it, I was checking the prices and it seems like it's gone up since I remember. I, I remember, well, it was probably 10 or 15 years ago, I bought this pack off of eBay 
and it's quite striking. It's really good quality. What you're looking for is kind of like a, an even distribution of these little dark, they're like little knots or pips. And then you have regular grain, which looks really wild, like compressed, curly, or fiddleback here and there. And then these dark areas, it's outstanding when you get a finish on it. It's just unreal. And so you can pick out where you want to use this. And with wood like this, even though it's small, you can do matches, like a book match, like that. Or you can do a four-piece match, whether this one comes over here, and then this one comes over here. I don't know if I'm doing this well enough for you to see that, but... So then you would have kind of a mirror all around. But what I usually try to do is number them before I start playing around with how I'm going to arrange them because you want to keep them sequential so that in case you do some matching, you're always kind of cutting the piece right next to the other one so the pattern doesn't change much later, later. Because it changes considerably as you go down through those layers. So anyway, that is what we're going to be using tonight. Now this wood, what has puzzled and puzzled me and I've wanted to find the best solution for this is what's the best way to fill those voids. Can you see those dark spots? Well, they're not all knots. A lot of them are actually holes in the wood. Let me put a light behind here. This may screw you up. Let's see. Does that screw it up? Can you see those no. holes? Mm -hmm. Can you see the holes? Yeah. Look how many holes are in there. All those little pips have holes and that requires filling after the fact. So I want to use this veneer, but I had to solve that issue. So we're going to take this veneer through our paces and just I just want to show you how I use a, an exotic, apparently troublesome veneer like this to great effects. So let's get into it. All right, so the first thing is treating a piece like this. You've got to get it out of the potato chip family and flat and more pliable in order to work with it and cut it and have control. So they sell this material called veneer softener. You can make your own. It's some kind of, <laughs> some kind of mixture between water and glycerin and something else. And honestly, to, by the time you gather all those materials and mix them all up, it's just cheaper to me to buy the material. Uh, we added links. There's a place called veneersupplies.com. Check that site out. What I like about that site is there's a lot of information on there that you can read about various types of veneer, um, veneer that's sold with backers and why, and um, you, know, you can get this veneer softener. They have a lot of stuff like veneer saws and softener and all that. So this has like a glycerin in there. That's a key element which helps to soften and relax the, the cells in the wood. And you, it comes at double strength. So you really, I think you can get a quart bottle. That's probably all you need. But if you get a gallon, it'll last you quite a while. Because <laughs> you're going to cut it in half. You're going to add half water to it, and it works really well. So what I do to treat this is... I spritz it on both sides. I'm just going to spritz this side. I've got it mixed, my half and half mix in here. And because this grain is so bizarre, like you've got side grain, but you've got a lot of swirly grain, the capillary action takes it really fast right through where the grain is diving down. And you can, you'll see it get wet on one side in certain places, but not others. So you just lightly spritz it. Make sure the whole thing is wet through, but you don't have to have it dripping wet. But once you get it good and dampened, you're going to set it aside. I've known some veneer guys who actually have a clothesline in their shop, and they, they, put them, they just hang them up for a while. Okay? So they put them on the line. I usually just stand mine over somewhere and let them sit until they... No more moisture's on there. They, they just feel, they're not wet, but they feel still like there's a dampness to the wood. That's when you want to press them. So I will take 
some type of paper. If you have some heavy paper, ideal, you know, if you can get some, uh, some kind of butcher paper that's thicker, this is uh, grocery bag paper, the brown paper. But if you have access, that's a good absorbent type of paper. But let me be warn you, uh, don't use <laughs> the logo if you go to Market Basket like we do, because it tends to bleed through to the other side, and that will actually leach right onto your wood, which I found out the hard way. So um, mm. keep it away. It didn't really hurt anything. This is just this is why we do the experimenting, right? So I'm always advising use a test piece, try this out before you do it, and that will save you a little time. But what I'll do is put one or two sheets on both sides and then you can put some heavy, you can put it on a table with MDF on it, put some weights on it. But you know what I actually do? I, I put it in the vacuum press. Sometimes I'll, I'll separate with boards and stack up a bunch with a lot of paper in between and just press the whole thing. So that then when you come back the next day, usually I'll wait till the next day, I take it out of the press and I have something like this. So it's pretty flat. It's so much more relaxed, you know. It's just chilling here. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. It's just different, you know. Here you've got, this is wet, and, but it has a still kind of a stiffer, brittle feeling. And, of course, the potato chips. And then this has a little waviness there where I could have, um, I don't think I diluted that enough. So, But you don't want to wet it too much or you'll have some little... Oh, look, there's the, uh, the color coming through. So we're going to glue that face down. Hopefully that won't be an issue on our test piece. But I see something there, too. <laughs> All right, so now that once I take it out of the bag, you know, I usually use it the next day. That, that glycerin does not harm the glue effects at all. So no worries there. I want to show you two ways of gluing down veneer like this. The first one is the... PBA method, just using regular glue. Like you can use um, the, the three types, you, the white glue, the yellow, or the type on three type that's more waterproof. Um, those, they're good glues, but they're not, they don't prevent creep over the long term. So if you're going to glue something up with a lot of seams, I typically will not use that. I'd rather use some glue that dries really hard. Uh, believe it or not, of those three, the one that creeps least is the white glue. So um, a couple glues that do not creep are one, hide glue, which is an older method. Um, typically, I'm using that in the hot form, but not very often. It's usually you want to use that to repair really fine antiques. Before 1950, all the glue was hide glue. But after that, PVAs came in and, you know, beginning with like an Elmer's type of white glue. And then they got more sophisticated with uh, different waterproof techniques. So we're going to glue down this with a PVA glue, a simple Elmer's, and it'll work just fine. But let's go ahead and uh, we'll get our piece over. We're going to use this little block. But you know what I noticed? Before I put this down, I've got a massive hole there. Look how big that one is. So I'm going to have to patch that after, and that's going to take some time. So one of the tricks that veneer specialists would have a nice selection of what you call veneer punches. So we've got these veneer punches and this one's like seven eighths diameter. This is an inch, but uh, the, the guy I got these from actually made this one asymmetrical. So it's harder to see that patch. And then we got close to a half an inch all the way down to this round and this small. I'm going to use this one, because it looks like I can cover this hole with that, okay? Now, the key to veneer patches is you work from the back. So I'm going to punch it from underneath. And this makes really quick work of it. You just got to do it in the right spot. 
I just want to, I'm really cutting it close here, so I don't want to miss getting that whole spot. I think I got it right there. And then you just tap it. Okay. And then I clean that edge. So it cleaned out a nice edge there. Now I'm going to bring in my patching veneer and I've just got a scrap piece here. I'm going to slip it under and look for something that looks kind of close with the color. It doesn't have to be perfect because this is very forgiving. I mean, I could put a little series of pips like right like that. That would be cool, huh? So let's do that. I'll just use those and it'll look like another little I'm just going to cover that. Legos. Almost looks like a cat's paw. All right. Watch the light. Okay. There we go. And where's my wire? I hope I didn't put it away. I did. Okay, I want to push that out. There we go. Okay, now I'll bring back my piece and I'm going to take this little patch and it's going to drop in right from behind and that's sweet how it goes right in like a puzzle piece because it was perfectly cut. Now the reason you work on the bottom is you get there's a little taper on those punches and it does create a little bit of a, a line there but it's very clean and flatter on the other side if, if we look at it. It's harder to see, isn't it? But because you have all those kind of patterns all over the place, it kind of melts away. And you can take your time and do like an incredible job matching it up, but I just wanted you to see how fast that actually can go. So just to make sure that doesn't pop out while we're gluing it down, I'm going to put a little piece of tape over that. But see how much faster that, that was than trying to patch it after the fact. It's just now... It's a full sheet of veneer. We're all set to go. All right, so I'm going to use a little white glue. Don't want to overdo it. And I'm just going to use this little roller. This is made to attach on the top of a glue bottle, but I'm always using it just freehand. I like it's a hard kind of glue roller. I need a little more there. I'm going to ask you a question on sure. that. I'm yeah. honestly not sure if it's related to veneer, but it will be clear to you, I'm sure. Um, Margaret's asking, I laminated African podduck and maple, prepped for finish, card scraped and sanded, cleaned and then wiped with cloth, soaked in denatured alcohol. Maple had pink stri streaks from paddock after. Mm -hmm. Same happened with spirit that's a good question i've heard people have problems with discoloration of maple around exotic woods like that because there are like oils in a lot of those woods and like paduk like that you close has a um a little of that oils in it but man i have not actually experienced that problem so i can't speak to why it's happening, but um, I've heard of things like that happening. This is a good place to have some pitching in here. I need your <laughs> help. Anyone have that experience with that problem with bleed? This is also one of the nice things about being in the neighborhood. We uh, help each other out like stuff. But So if anybody has an answer for that. All right. So. I've got the glue on the surface. I'm going to lay the veneer on there. Now, I didn't make this perfect. I know I got holes, but uh, it's just for demonstration purposes only. All right. Now, Tom, and if you stain that, will you see that punch outline? I'm not sure. I, I would never stain this. <laughs> I don't think you would, honestly. You might. You, you might. If you use a pigmented stain, that's where you, it's going to catch in there. But I'm thinking of a dye stain whenever I would use something like this. All right, so I'm going to go right into the vacuum bag right here. I'm just going to use this manual bag made by Raw Rocket. 
we put a link to them too. This is kind of fun to, if you don't want to put a lot of money into a powered system, which you can buy these different size bags and you just manually do it. And it actually holds the seal like a regular powered bag has to keep cycling on because usually you're going to have some leaks. But with this goop down here, <laughs> it, uh, it's amazing how it doesn't leak. But after you use it a few times, like I've done this one, it might. Um, I just try to get all the, the potential spots where it might leak here. And then they, they do give you additional strips of this black tar-like material. And uh, you can reseal. So you see you've got the valve here. This is where we're going to take the, the vacuum. And you need the mesh so that the air can bleed up and find a way. So I'm going to just use the hose on the sander just to get some of this out of there. Here we go. Okay, now I've got the pressure and I'm going to finish the pressure with it should be sealing. It's, I think it's, I think it will just I'll make sure one more time. Tom, does the veneering have to be used in a certain amount of time after being conditioned? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've, usually you're going to use it in the next few days. So I, I have kept it as long as a week or more. But if you keep it inside the paper, I keep it for a while. And it stays really um, flat and usable for quite a while. But... Typically, you know, I, I think you can go two weeks as long as you're keeping it, you know, flat between something kind of stored. Mark's mentioning okay. that he uses contact cement. Have you ever used that with the veneer? <coughs> you can use contact cement. I remember reading an article when I first got into this. It was in a book by Constantine's uh, out of New York. And they said, never use contact cement. But, you know, like it was bad. And uh, I have used it, and it, it works. It's fine enough in certain situations. I just don't, it's just so messy and caustic that I, there's too many other good options that I don't usually think of it. Um, so I'm going to show you. The other option, and we're going to go old school again. We've done this uh, a few times. I don't use high glue a lot, but it's involved in the filling process that I want to show you soon. So let's do a little high glue veneering. I've got in here in my glue pot, which keeps a temperature between 140 and 150. It's an electric pot, but you don't need to get something this fancy. I, I've heard, and maybe somebody can pitch in, that these candle wax pots are less expensive and keep the wax at about the same temperature. You can also use like a, a double boiler over a little electric plate or something in your shop. Just put a little double boiler in there. And I have, I'm using a jar of my hide glue in a little, about an inch of water that's in there and I keep this on. And that helps to keep it from evaporating too fast because it will, it will evaporate. Um, and then all you have to do is add a little more water or hide glue as needed. So there's only one remaining hide glue uh, processing factory in America and it's called Milligan and Higgins. And it's in Johnstown, New York, just west of Albany. And 
they make it still from cow hides. And there's a whole process. You can read all about it. I've, we've attached this article. There's three articles on hide, hide glue, part one, part two, and part three. And you can search them on Google. It's from, uh, what was the? Popular Woodworking. Uh, it was a popular woodworking series of ad, of of articles by Bob Flexner. So it's pretty fun to read through. He goes into the process of how they make it and um, various differences. This is what's nice about the Higgins, I'm sorry, the Milligan and Higgins, they use a process that gets rid of this bacteria that's so common in a lot of high glues, it just stinks. When you, when you melt it, it's disgusting to work with. And this is the first high glue I, I've had. I asked um, the guys at, um, Wood Finishing Enterprise, I go, did you get that from Milligan and Higgins? He goes, oh yeah, he said, that's all, that's the only place left. So this is uh, a number nine, 192, which just means high glue is rated by gram strength and it's just the amount of weight, how many grams it takes to dent the hardened, you know, gelled up hard surface of, that's how they test it. So. A lower gram strength number is a softer, weaker bond, and the higher is a lot more. So 192 is typical. 192 gram strength is typical for furniture makers. And the reason you don't really want it too much higher than that is as you go higher, you have less time to work with it. It gels faster, but it ends up drying harder and stronger. So instrument makers tend to use the 251 gram strength, but it goes all the way up to like 512. So that stuff is just too fast. And that's the challenge with high glue is that as it cools, it gels and it, you, it tacks and you're just done. If you don't have it clamped up, you're in trouble. But that's the beauty of it too. Because it's so fast, you can do these little rub fits with glue blocks and put things together. And you can hammer veneer, which I wanna show you right now. So I've got this liquidy enough. So I just wanna get it on the surface. And in the winter time, I've, you probably take an iron and warm up the wood that you're going on and it'll give you longer time because you don't want this to, and I would have a bigger brush than this if I was going on a larger surface. But I just wanna get some on the surface and then and then some on the veneer. What's really interesting about hide glue is that it doesn't mess with the finish. It's, it's very strong, but you can like shellac right over it and it won't be an issue. So that's why like sometimes when you have PVA glues and they squeeze through, you see like this clear spot or something like that. This is really no problem for that. Okay, I've got that on there. Now I'm even going to put some on the top side because it adds a slickness to hammering it out and it doesn't hurt anything. And if you had larger veneers, you can't work too big of a spot with this, but you can, if you get caught, you can always take an iron and just lightly go over. So I'm going to start from the middle and work my way out. I think I've got a good spot right about there. you use a liquid hide glue for veneering, Tom? What's that? Can you use liquid hide glue for veneering? I think I'm a little thin on that. I, gotta, I might be too thin on my veneer. Um, yeah, liquid hide glue is not the hot version. It's um, liquid hide has like a urea added to it. So it operates just like the PVA glues. So it's kind of... I mean, one of the nice things about high glue is that it, it grabs fast, so you're losing that. I hope this isn't too thin. I did it earlier and it worked fine at this thickness. Do I you have, have a thickness preference of burled veneer? Uh, what do you mean? What thickness of burled veneer do you prefer? Is oh. it thicker better? If so, how thick is best? Well, it when you buy in veneer, it tends to come in 40... A 42nd of an inch, pretty standard for veneer in general. I'm not going to worry about being perfect about this. I just want you to see the process. 
So I'm squeezing out. You can see it kind of coming out. I'd want that just a touch thicker, but it's, it's starting to grab now. Maybe not out at the edge, but. So that's basically the idea. You just hammer. What's, what's nice, you're not tech hammering when they say hammer, but you're using a hammer's edge for pressure. I, I've made boards. You don't need a fancy hammer. You can just have a board. Um, you can put like a, a bead of brass in there and you can just pressure. It's just to get, give you that leverage. But having that little bit of glue on the surface makes it slide and gives you really good pressure. And you can feel it just going down like a rock. All right, so that's it. Then I would just set this aside. And you really want to let it go overnight to really harden up. So once you've got your, your veneer down, however you got it down, you're going to take it out of the bag and you're going to have a piece like this. So I've already sanded this half. But I'm going to sand this half now, and this is just with the straight uh, white glue as my base. Let's see here. I'm going to sand just with an orbital, and I'm, I'm starting with 150. All right, there we go. I can see a little bit of the blue from my grocery bag. <laughs> That's not good. But see these little white circles? Can you? That white circle and that, that, and that. There's a bunch of them. Those are actually, you're seeing through to the plywood below. So those are holes. There's a lot of them. So I can't just finish this. And this is that puzzling issue which precipitated this whole presentation, <laughs> to be honest. I wanted to experiment and do a little figuring about this. And I did searches and read a lot about people's different methods for this. And you can get regular fillers. I mean, you could take just like the wood dough, like a lot of times, you know, if I'm just trying to fill a little spot, I'll use like a, pay, a hardening wood filler like this. and you put it in there and sand it off later. But that would be labor intensive and those have a kind of glue in there that can go down and it can be resistant to the finish that goes on if you don't get it all off and it leaves like a little halo. So I wasn't liking that and it's, it's kind of a pain to know if you've gotten them all. And then what I, one of the articles that I read that I really found compelling was making your own wood paste using hide glue. So for these type of pips here, they're kind of like, a, they vary from a, a dark to medium brown color. Some of them are really jet black here and there, but it's very forgiving to fill them. You don't have to have the exact color, but what um, I read recommended and I was thinking myself was to use walnut wood dust with the hide glue. So I've got a piece of walnut right here and I'm just going to make a little dust very quickly. And I'm going to use a, just on my block, I've got 150 grit. I'm going to watch for my dust to accumulate here. Try to keep pushing it to the end. All right, that should do it. I did a little bit earlier, and I've got a little in this cup. I'm just going to push it off into the cup. Okay, so we just got a little wooden 
dust in there. You could do more. But I'm going to mix just a tiny bit of this so I can show you. Here, I'll get my little jar out. So here's the hide glue in there. And that is a little thin, but it's good for this because you want it a little thinner to do this because you're going to mix it with all that dough in there. I mean, the dust and make a dough. So I'll just put it right in there. And then with a stick, we're making our own filler. Can you talk about the comparison or the advantages of hammering versus vacuum pressing? Well, it's two different, it depends on the type of glue. Like you hammer veneer with hot hide glue because it cures so fast. You wouldn't have time to get it in the vacuum bag. The vacuum press is for longer setting glues or for laminations um, where you need You have the time. So the only reason I was hammering was for specifically that's a method associated with hot hide glue. You have a cooling characteristic and you can do it that way. It wouldn't make sense with other types of glues uh, because they don't have those same properties. So anyway, I've got, that's a little bit runny. I'm going to add just a little more wood dust and then we'll be ready. We'll have our gel ready. So let me make a little more dust here. There's an endless supply. <laughs> it's cheap. <laughs> All right, so I could get that a tiny bit thicker, but basically that's the idea. And I just take this paste and it goes into the various holes, but I don't have to worry specifically. I'm just going to bring it all around and use it like a paste. So just press it in and you just move and you can kind of fill these fast. It's not as thick as that other material. And what's nice about it, even though it looks like you're making a mess on the surface, it's, it's very uh, easy to deal with in terms of top coating with finishes. It's not going to be a problem with all the discoloration issues you'll face with other types of paste fillers like this. So you got to get, you know, you're filling up these pretty good size holes. Um, so maybe you just answered this because uh, Will's asking, would wood grain filler tinted with dark skin work, dark stain work, or are the pits too deep for this? I think it's too deep for that. I, I'm looking more for a paste wood filler. I, I mean, not a grain filler. Grain fillers are nice, but they're, they're really softer. They're not made for a hard build. So I think this, you can look at it. This is more, this is very close to wood dough. So I'm getting this in a nice kind of, it's starting to dry a little bit more. So it's working nicely now as a good wood paste. But look, it's going in all those little places and before you know it, you're covered. So I would just do that, make sure I've covered the whole thing. And I end up with a board, something like this. So this one I did earlier and I've already sanded this side. But so this is dry and it's hard, but it's, it's a nice paste using the the uh, hide glue. And I had read some other articles recently. I was reading about veneering and trying to reduce creep or anything like that. Hide glue is an excellent glue to reduce creep. It also works as a beautiful sizing material like to fill grain right before you put on your final coats. You can use it on the top with a squeegee method, almost like I filled here, but you'd be using the clear hide glue. And if you had a little squeegee on a, I'm talking like a complex surface, it works, it can work as a, a pretty great grain filler and also gets in all those little cracks and crevices. And then you sand it back. And because it's so compatible with finishes, 
it's a wonderful way of of sizing and just preparing a surface that's really got some wild figure so that it won't telegraph and crack open. What do you think about um, that method for long cracks and crotch veneer? Yes, I, I would think uh, that's a perfect question. That actually is what I was just addressing with uh, using the hide glue on top of the material. If you mix it with paste, if you, um, wood dust like this, you're getting a heavier kind of filler paste. Uh, but It'll work even in little tiny fissures like those little surface checks that are hard, take longer to fill. If you're French polishing or something like that, that's another way to fill those with a pumice and a French polish as you do your early coats. That's another method that the old masters would use to lay down the base coat of a French polish and fill the grain. But this, I like the idea of the hide glue in certain cases when you're working with crazy figured grains that you might have a lot of joints because you're adding the glue effect and the stabilizing effect of the glue underneath as a sizing filler. All right, so here we go. All right, so it seems to be sanding off quite nicely. I would spend a little more time just to be sure, but if we look over here now, everything looks pretty filled, but I know I missed one. I've, here's, here's one that didn't get filled. It looked like it did, but, but all the rest look pretty nice, and they're up to snuff. That, um, there was some debate as to whether the hide glue uh, shrinks back, but... I think with the wood dough, it's very minimal from what I was reading. Um, and then when you get it to this point, you're going to look into the surface and you're going to see all these little dark spots. But here I have a clear kind of glazed one. That may be, it looks to me like it's just glue. That could just be white glue filled that hole. So I would go around, this might be a touch dark, but if you just touch on those little glue spots, yeah, I think this might be a little darker than I want. Well, another method I use is put on a coat of shellac first, and then you can do this touch up, and you have more control. Let's try that. I'm going <laughs> to... I would have... See, yeah, that's one of the things about... When you're using touch-up markers like this, and I do have... We do have a link to a mohawk marker. They make them in a lot of different colors. This one's nutmeg. It's a little dark of brown. I put a kind of a warm medium brown link there. You can buy whole sets of these markers. They're nice when you're dealing with stuff like this or things in general. And what I like to do is actually put that first wash coat of shellac down because it acts as a sealer or whatever your first coat of finish is. And then it becomes more apparent where you have those little clear glue spots like, like that or something that might need a little touch up. Then you can touch it up with much greater control. You can see what happened on that one. Because I didn't have this surface sealed, because I didn't have the surface sealed, I got more absorption and you, you lose a little control of it. So it might go darker than you wanted. Like I felt that. So that's how I usually do it. So let me see. All right, so I've got a little shellac here. Let's see what it looks like. We're going to just, this is a, probably a pound and a half to a two pound cut. And this is um, de-waxed shellac. It's a blonde shellac that we made not long ago. This is just to get some sizing. Are you, are you seeing that okay? Mm -hmm. It's not glare? Nope. 
I want to get over to some of these pips that, wow, they look pretty nicely. A lot of them are very close to being filled. It might be the kind of thing that you have to do two applications on too, like you sand it. All right, so let's do this one. All right, so see where I touched that one? It looks dark, but it wouldn't even be objectionable because there are some other dark ones to begin with. That's why this stuff is so forgiving. But isn't that beautiful? Nice. And then once this dried, then I could touch up any that looked a little off or clear or unnatural. So I can definitely see this one that I didn't fill that I pointed out earlier. And I can see others that are definitely filled with that paste from earlier. So you go right on and do that whole top, but look at how lively that gets. Is that a so bad pretty. angle? Yeah, so pretty. Can you see it all right? All right, and now I have another panel. I wanted to test this because I'm not. This is, I hammered this down just like we did our other panel earlier and I sanded it, but I had just high glue right on the whole surface. I want to see how it reacts with this shellac. It's going on beautifully. It's not as amber. Maybe it's sealing the grain a little more. I'm not getting as amber an effect, but pretty close. I could just add a little more to the, but it's the same beautiful effect. And that was just hammered on. But I think I would, in most cases, I'd be putting it down with some type of PVA or um, there's a Unibond 1 type glue that dries very hard, doesn't allow for creep uh, as well. And that you can get from veneer pressing systems. Also, you want 800, which is a urea formaldehyde type glue, quite often used with laminations because it dries, it doesn't slip at all. Um, but the, you know, when you're not worried about the creep so much, the type on, I mean, the type on one or white glue will work just fine. So that's a nice little trick for using exotic veneers. This was a nice little precursor to an actual project build coming on down the road. So I hope you enjoyed that. And as always, if you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing and liking and sharing and hitting the red button, right? Red button. And uh, check out over to epicwoodworking.com. We've got courses and the mailing list over there is just too good not to and be the on. And the neighborhood community. Yeah, that's right. All right, everybody, thanks so much for hanging out with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you again next week, right back here.